All right, let's uh, pick up. We're at the bottom of page number 53. We've read the text for the remainder of chapter number 3. And uh, notice in verse number 12, ye men of Israel. Again, it's important to remember that the book of Acts is transitional. In the early chapters of the book of Acts, we're trying to continue to minister to unbelieving Israel. Now, they have crucified Christ, their, their Messiah, and um, we see in the early chapters that there's a revival that is taking place. But Peter, being the main character, the main preacher here, is the one that is out front, and he is boldly declaring to the Jewish people what they have done, trying to bring others into the fold, un unto conversion and belief in Christ. So we start at the bottom of page 53, ye men of Israel. So this is directed at the men of Israel as chapter 2, verse 14, we know. And uh, notice how Peter is establishing the, his credibility and the importance of their Jewishness, the fact that they're Israelites. It says in verse number 13, he references the God of our fathers. And then he references the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Verse 14, he accuses them. He says, ye denied the Holy One and the just. In your notes, I've given you some cross-references there. Jesus is given in excess of 200 different names in the Scripture. Uh, he is the um, Alpha and the Omega. He is the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. He is the Word of God. He is the Good Shepherd. He, and there's so many other. He's the resurrection and the life. We could go on and on of all the terms or phrases or words they're used with reference to Christ. And there's three of them here. In verse 14, there's two, the Holy One. He is called the Just. And then in verse 15, He is called the Prince of Life. And again, we've given you some other good cross-references there where Christ is called a Prince. He's not only called a Prince here, but uh, in the Psalms, in John, in 1 John, and Isaiah chapter number 9, and then we've included in the text here another passage from Acts chapter 5, 31, and then <clears throat> Revelation chapter 1. But what follows there in your notes is this statement from verse 15, of which we are witnesses. Again, this is a major theme in the book. We are witnesses. And we've given you a sampling of other verses in the book of Acts that use the term witness. We are witnesses. What do witnesses do? Witnesses are called into a courtroom, and then they are asked to share with the judge all of the attendants that are there, the prosecuting and defense attorneys, they are asked to share what they know to be true. And, of course, the uh, lawyers that ask the questions are very specific and very careful in what they ask and what information they are trying to uh, draw out of the witness. In fact, they will define and redefine their question to make sure that the person, that the witness who is on the stand really understands the question. And if they answer it somewhat ambiguously, then the lawyer will narrow the field of the, of the possible answers the individual may give. But the point is this, they're there to tell what they know to be true. That's what we are. Simply put as Christians, we can be evangelists, that's another word, uh, we are soul winners, we could be uh, called uh, other names, too. We're, uh, in, there's one that's Fishers of Men. That's the one I'm thinking of right now. Another name that we're uh, commonly referenced or referred to as Christian people. We are 
fishers of men. But this is important. I've highlighted this in my notes. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. That was the commission, that we were to go not only to preach the gospel, but we shall be witnesses, Jesus said, unto me. Chapter 2, chapter 4, 5, 8. And I've said, etc., because there will be a longer list as we go through our, no our notes. <clears throat> through faith in his name, again, the Lord Jesus Christ. Each one of those names means something. And we're to have faith in the Lord Jesus, the Savior, the Anointed One, the Christ. This is the first time that the word faith is mentioned in the book of Acts. And that has to be one of the most important principles in all Scripture. Uh, underneath that statement we read from Ephesians chapter 2, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Without faith, the book of Hebrews says, it is impossible to please God. So faith is required. Another uh, term, belief or trust. Those terms would be essentially synonymous with the term faith, having faith. Now in this passage, it's unclear whose faith is referenced when we're talking about the paralytic because I don't know that he had a whole lot of I don't know that he was, this was a spiritual, initially a spiritual experience for him. His legs do not work. He's grown used to that for 40 years. He's looking for some money to help him survive. How much faith does he have in what's taking place here? Uh, the faith was, I believe, was in Peter to follow the uh, command of the Lord Jesus. Matthew chapter 10, verses 1 verse number 8, Luke chapter 9, where he was given the authority and the power to heal and to cure diseases. The healing is done by the authority that is given to the apostles, as we've said before. Coupled with faith, it results in a complete healing called, in the text, perfect soundness. Again, these were testable and observable results that took place. Then Peter gives them, as I mentioned a few moments ago, he gives them a partial pass when he says this. He says, through ignorance you did it. You really didn't know what you were doing. Jesus says something similar in Luke on the cross when he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And uh, although they were unjustly condemning someone, they knew that, but they really didn't understand what they were doing. They were crucifying the anointed one of Jehovah. Acts chapter 13, verse 27, uh, reinforces this thought when it says, For they that dwelt at Jerusalem and the rulers, because they knew him not, nor yet the voices of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, they have fulfilled them in condemning him. They were ignorant. Now, they should have known. There's no excuse for this ignorance. They're still guilty, but uh, ignorance is no excuse. They should have known. They, sh they should have figured this out. Their ignorance was a result of failing to understand, interpret correctly, and believe Scripture. You've probably heard that before, haven't you? Isn't that the case with most people? Most people are ignorant. It is our responsibility to be witnesses. People fail to understand the consequences or the reality or the truth of the historical record of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. They do not interpret those events correctly, and consequently, along with all of that, they just don't believe what's written in the Word of God. They don't believe it. This is, to them, maybe a, it's a nice story, and there's good things in it and all that, but to believe that an individual is reading the absolute truth when they read the Bible, <laughs> there are a lot of Christians that don't believe that. you got to kind of give a pass to the unbeliever, don't you? The average man on the street, 
No, he doesn't believe that this is the absolute word of God. What a difference that makes in a person's life once you come to the understanding that you hold the instruction manual for life in your hands when you read the scriptures. They did not. Verse 18 says, Those things which God before had showed by the mouth of all his prophets he hath so fulfilled. And there's some list, a listing of passages in the Old Testament that they missed, they were ignorant of, or they misinterpreted, or they just didn't believe them, whatever. There's listed uh, Isaiah 53, Daniel 9. I might say the book of Zechariah, the third one uh, at the, in that list, the book of Zechariah is a very interesting book. We'll get back to that in just a little while in our study uh, today. You see a couple passages as you go to page number 56. There's another one from chapter 13 of Zechariah, but let's look at the practical applications here. Practical application. Peter's come a long way in 50 days, has he not? He's come a long way. The difference, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we've stated that before. It's the greatest motivator for Christianity, for true Christianity. Christ is risen. It's the greatest event in the history of mankind that Christ died. He was buried. Three days he came out of that grave and his resurrection, according to uh, just reading through the New Testament and collecting all of the witnesses or testimonies, there are 12 occurrences or of the appearance of Christ after his crucifixion, after his burial, 12 of them in the Bible. And one of those 12 references says that he was seen of above 500 people. So there were many, many witnesses. And by the way, 1 Corinthians mentions that. And when 1 Corinthians was written, 20, at the most 25 years after the resurrection of Christ, many of the people that witnessed those 500 people were still alive. So you want to go to one of them? Let's say half of those people were still alive. There's 250 living witnesses of the resurrection of Christ, not to mention the apostles who were writing these, uh, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, these texts. There's many witnesses still alive uh, 20, 25 years later to either confirm or deny the fact of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The healing of the paralytic, complete and immediate. We mentioned that. The third practical application, meeting a man at the point of his physical or material needs opens the door to addressing and meeting his needs at a much deeper level. Your ADP, your sports ministry, our sports ministry at our church, is one illustration and example of doing this. Uh, we don't live in a community where people need to be fed. We don't have paralytics literally laying all over the street um, waiting for some kind of a healing. We don't have people starving to death. I'm not saying that every need is met, but we live in a culture and a time when we live with a lot of bounty. We live with a lot of stuff, excess, if you please. You know what people are looking for? They're looking for a pla safe place for their children to have interaction with adults and children. That's what sports ministries provide for kids. It's something that kids love to do. It's a place where parents can feel safe. And then by exerting our efforts, by bringing forth our efforts, our talents, supervising, and being part of programs like that, what we do is we, in, a, in essence, we buy an opportunity to have an influence in our community. I think those are good things, good things to do. The last thing, on page 56, Peter used every life experience and opportunity to speak of the wonderful works of God. His message was totally Christ-centered and filled with biblical and theological background and understanding. This thought should not slip by. We need to preach Christ. It's not the church. It's not the pastor. It's not the sports program. It's not the good people at First Bible Baptist. That's not, you should see our auditorium. You, you should taste our coffee at our, 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 our uh, coffee house. That is, 
No, that's not what <laughs> Christianity is all about. Although we ought to do our best and be excellent in everything we do, that's not what Christianity is all about. It's about Jesus. Focus on Jesus. He needs to be part of every conversation that we have with, some, with uh, believers and unbelievers. We need to be in the habit of talking about him and being witnesses. We're telling people what we know to be true. So let's continue here in chapter number uh, 3 on page number 57. Peter preaches to the men of Israel. Now there's a message coming here, and this is again important. The Lord is not done with the nation of Israel. He hasn't bailed on Israel. There are those that believe a term that is uh, used to refer to such people is replacement theology. And what replacement theology is, is, is essentially this, that God is done with the nation of Israel. They rejected him. God said, okay, I'm taking all of the promises that were given to you from Genesis up through even the ministry of Christ himself, and I'm taking all of those promises, and now I'm giving them to the church. So Israel is totally, the nation of Israel is totally out of the picture. So for people like me who believe that God's st still dealing with the nation of Israel, we're just out of sync, according to these replacement theologians. We're just out of sync with what's really going on in the Bible. All of the Old Testament promises to the nation of Israel have not been repudiated or negated by the Lord. Now, it is true that the church, that believers do get in on a lot of those. One illustration is this. In Jeremiah chapter 31, Jeremiah prophesied about the new covenant. And certainly the church has the privilege of enjoying the benefits, many, if not all, of the benefits of the new covenant. But that doesn't mean that that covenant that was given in Jeremiah to the nation of Israel is no longer in effect to, it, to the nation of Israel. It is. I reference the book of Zechariah. Go to the book of Zechariah and read the last chapters of the book of Zechariah that talk about the last days and what God will do for the nation of Israel. Now, the replacement theologian will do this. Every time you see a promise to the nation of Israel, you need to cross that out and plug in the name New Testament Church. That's what replacement theology does. And um, I believe it's a travesty of Scripture. Blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. That's what Romans says. Many passages in the Old and in the New Testament that promise us and state very clearly that God is not done with Israel. And certainly here in Acts chapter number 3, God is not done uh, with Israel. So Peter preaches then in verse 12 through 26, he preaches to this wondering crowd. You can follow with me on page 58 of your notes, if you would, and you can, see in, you can see the message of Peter kind of outlined under A, B, and C at the top of the page. These are the, excuse me, these are the elements that were uh, included in his sermon, if I can use that term. You can read through them at your leisure, and we'll reference many of them here in these next few moments. But we see Peter's call, near the bottom of page number 58, Peter's call to repentance. Let's read it together. Acts 3.19, Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things which God has spoken by the mouth of his holy prophets since the world began. Jesus sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. Notice throughout this chapter, nowhere is Peter saying, by the way, Israel, you're done. You've had it. The promises are no longer valid for you because you got an F on the greatest test of your life. You have crucified the Messiah. 
chapter 3, verse 19, the word repent. It appears, or forms of the word, appear about 100 times in Scripture. And the word stresses the need for a change in direction, a change of one's mind. Jesus, John, Paul, all of them preached repentance, and he said, and in this text, Peter said, be converted, turn, change. I've included there at the top of page 59 a definition from John Gill's Body of Divinity on repentance and what it is. He gives several different uh, aspects of repentance here. If you don't understand it after reading that, I'm not sure you'll ever understand it. But the purpose is that sins may be blotted out. This is another way to describe obtaining forgiveness. The term means to wipe away, erase, or obliterate. Peter offers the opportunity to have the penalty of sin removed completely when the times of refreshing come. If you have a Bible, I hope you do, Romans chapter 11. Let's look. I uh, referred to this verse uh, just a little bit ago, but let's look at Romans chapter 11 and read it from the text of Scripture. Let's go to verse number 25. Romans chapter 11, verse number 25 says, For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until, not forever, until, (coughs) excuse me, until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. And so all Israel shall be saved as it is written. There shall come out of Sion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes, but as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sake. He's talking about the nation of Israel. The term elect is used several different ways in Scripture. There are elect angels. Jesus is called the elect. There's the word with reference to those who have come to Christ as Savior. So it's used at least four different ways in the Scripture, the term elect. Well, anyway, this is a time that is yet future. There's no indication, again, in Paul's writings in Romans or here in Acts chapter 3, that God is absolutely done with Israel. He doesn't want to have anything more to do with them, and now the church is taking or assuming all of the promises that were given to the nation of Israel, and Israel is out. They're on the back porch with nothing. The times of refreshing. The term refreshing means revival. Peter's preaching is the same context of John the Baptist in Matthew chapter 3 and Matthew in chapter number 4. What are we talking about? John and Jesus were preaching a coming kingdom. This is what Israel was looking for. They're looking for a kingdom to come. That was promised all through the Old Testament, the Davidic covenant. God was going to bring a king who would literally rule and reign. We understand that period of time as the millennial reign of Christ that is still yet future. And what what Peter is saying is, and preaching, is essentially the same message that John and Jesus preached. This is what we would call the realized kingdom. Matthew chapter 19, the apostles were expecting it because of the words of Jesus in 1928. This is also the rest that is referred to, not every time the word rest is referenced in Hebrews 3 and 4, but some of the uh, times the word rest is a reference to this time of refreshing. And we've given you several other passages there that reference this millennial rest, this time of refreshing that God has promised to the uh, nation of Israel. Notice the text that we just read is included in your notes there at the bottom of page 59, and then 
we are promised in verse 20 of chapter 3 that he shall send Jesus Christ. And we know that. Uh, Jesus promised that he went, he went to prepare a place, but he would come again in John chapter 14. In Acts chapter 1, we saw the promise that this same Jesus, which you saw taken up, that he would come again. We see that in these other passages at the top of page number 60. Again, the times of refreshing, the times of restitution of all things, we have fur further with other scriptures defined what that means, and we've already given you indication of when that would take place. But notice the whole passage is directed at the men of Israel, verse number 12. It's an indictment against the corporate rejection of Messiah and a pleading to turn back to Jehovah, receive his Messiah, and realize the promises of the kingdom and remember their sin no more. That's what this is all about. Israel was looking for a kingdom. By the way, Israel, those that are more orthodox even today, they're looking for a king and a kingdom. They rejected Christ because he didn't come as, a, as they expected, a king who would overrule uh, the Gentiles, the Romans, and would control the earth at that time and set up a kingdom in Jerusalem where the nation of Israel would be the favored, the elect people of God. And because that didn't take place the way they wanted it to or hoped it to at that time, they rejected Jesus. But they're still looking for that. They're still looking. This is believing Israel. There are many there are many Israelites, Jews today, who are just agnostic, maybe even atheistic. They're just Jews nationalistically, not theologically. The writings of Moses and the Old Testament have little meaning to them. They're traditions, and they love their traditions and all that, but they have no real practical application for them uh, today theologically speaking. Of course, they're wrong in that. Uh, God has not forsaken the nation of Israel. And I believe that the book of Revelation, that is the last book in our New Testament, has a lot to do with God's dealing with the nation of Israel prior to that millennial reign. Chapters 5 through 18 all deal with how God will deal with the nation of Israel in a period of time we call the tribulation. Chapter 19 speaks of the second coming of Christ, their prince, when he will come. For them, they'll think it's the first time. For you and I, this is the second coming of Jesus Christ. And then chapter number 20, the kingdom that they're looking for and we're looking for is set up in Revelation chapter number 20. We call that the thousand-year reign of Christ, the millennial reign of Christ. So there's several different uh, references there. It would behoove you to take the time to look through Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. You'll see how many references there are to, these, to this kingdom. These promises are not done away with. These are promises that God said he would fulfill. And again, for the replacement theologian, he's taking all of these passages of Scripture throwing Israel out of the picture and replacing Israel with the church. All of these promises are now, supposedly, according to the replacement theologian, therefore the church. Peter is essentially offering the opportunity to hasten the return of Jesus by embracing him on a national level, something that must happen before Jesus will return. And when we get into the book of Revelation, we see how all of that transpires. One may raise, and this is only a hypothetical question, I'll just raise it because people do ask it, if the Jews of that day would have received the gospel on a national level, then would Jesus have returned way back then? Would there be a church age and all of that? That's a question I don't think it's worth even um, thinking through that, although I've spent a lot of time doing it when I probably shouldn't have. 
Now let's wrap this up here with this, these last uh, five verses of this chapter. For Moses truly said unto the fathers, a prophet, Acts 3.22, a prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. This is uh, quotations of Moses in the Old Testament. Him shall ye hear, and all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. And it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. Yea, and all the prophets from Samuel and those that follow after, as many as have spoken, have likewise foretold of these days. Ye are the children of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham, And in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. Does it sound like Peter's doing away with Israel here? Unto you first, God, having raised up his son Jesus, send him to bless you in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. The quotations are from the book of Deuteronomy. They're quotations uh, from Moses from the law. The law is, uh, the, the law is a, a general term that really references for many the whole Old Testament, but specifically references the first five books, which are also called the Torah, the Pentateuch, or the five books of Moses. And you can see on page 61 uh, the quotations from Deuteronomy 18 that are referenced here in Acts chapter number 3. Every soul which will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed. That's from Leviticus chapter 23, verse 29. Again, the author of that is Moses himself. The prophets foretold of these days. This is the prophecy of the new covenant from Jeremiah. I referenced that just a few moments ago. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Do, does it seem like we're going to do away with Israel here? No, does it say, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the church? Because the house of Israel will be discarded. The house of Judah will be discarded. No. The promise is still there. You can read through Jeremiah 31, 2, 3, and 4 there. In that day, I referenced the book of Zechariah just a few moments ago. Take, a, take some time and read through these verses. If you have, are unfamiliar with Zechariah, and many people are because it is one of the minor prophets that is the material is less than that of the major Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, prophets. If you're not familiar with Zechariah, that is a great book. It's like an Old Testament book of Revelation, particularly the last chapters of Zechariah, particularly the verses that are mentioned here in this text. Again, God is not through with the nation of Israel. God is going through his preachers, through Christ, first of all, through the apostles, through Peter. He is going and bringing the gospel of the kingdom and the gospel of Christ to the Jewish people first. We see that all through uh, these first chapters of the book of Acts. Notice as you turn the page, Peter's quoting the law. Genesis chapter 12, we've included that. And notice in verse 26, he uses the term unto you first. We've included several New Testament passages that only reinforce that the gospel was to first go to the nation of Israel. Why? Verse 26, turning away every one of you from his iniquities. And again, promises, verses from the Old Testament. Now, Romans chapter 11, verse 26 that demands a little bit of explanation, and we'll get into that as we get further into the study. Uh, you could take that at face value and say that every Jew that ever lived, all Israelites will ultimately be saved. That isn't the uh, proper interpretation of the text, and we'll deal with that in a, in a future lesson, Romans eleven twenty six. But at the top of page 63, and we'll conclude this portion right now. We're about 35 minutes in. The corporate salvation of Israel 
the remnant of Romans 11 and Zechariah 13, is the subject of Peter's message, but it will be accomplished by individuals turning away from his iniquities. Peter personalizes the message and implies the question, what are you going to do about it? God deals with his elect people, the nation of Israel. Elect is used, the nation of Israel is called elect. Jesus is called elect. There are elect angels in the Bible, and Christians, believers, are called elect. So every time the term elect is used is not necessarily a reference to what the uh, hyper-Calvinist would refer to as the elect. God deals with his elect people. However, not all Israel or not all Israelites will be saved. Only the individuals who make up the remnant are the true Israel, and all Israel will be saved. All right, that finishes up chapter number three. Let's take a break right now for just a few moments, and you can use this for questions and answers. Just time to get a little relief from me.